So moving on to the next award that we're going to focus on is the Leonard Phillipson Award. Uh, this award is a bit of a newer award. It was established in 2014 by Emblem and is currently supported uh, by Gabor Lam, uh, who is really the champion of this award. So Gabor, I'm not sure if you're hiding here in the audience, but we send you our thanks again. Um, big round of applause for our sponsors for this award. Thank you. <laughs> We have had eight winners for this award, and we have a very special visitor today, Thomas Graft. He's going to introduce this year's recipient of the Leonard Phillips Award. If you'd like to come up, Thomas, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, I feel myself here as a fossil, a living fossil. Um, because I was here, I joined Emble in 1983. Uh, it was barely, I think, five or six years old. And I just, be before I start talking about Sarah, I want to give a little bit, you know, how it was for me when I moved here and how Emble impacted me. And so, of course, uh, the founding director of Emble was, was John Kendrew. And at that time, the philosophy was to create an institute that develops instrumentation mostly that would be difficult to develop in more uh, local laboratories and that would be useful for the whole of Europe. And this was, I think, a very good idea to which I think Emble is coming back now with this imaging center that I saw today. It's really impressive. Uh, but then at, at that time when I was there, I must say uh, several of the projects that were started were non-starter because they were the instruments were developed where there were, was no biological clientele. And then when Leonard Philipson was appointed as the new director in 1982 um, as a virologist and, and it was the advice of the Science Advisory Board, he decided to bring in more biology. And I was downhill at the German Cancer Center working with tumor viruses. And so he called me one day and said, would you like to become a coordinator? I didn't know much about EMBL and what a coordinator is, but then when he explained to me, I immediately said, of course, yes. And it gave me the opportunity to hire uh, a whole, uh, the, what's now called a unit, by the way, uh, a whole new uh, set of people to work around what, what, what turned out to be initially um, people working on oncogenes and growth control, although we called the program the differentiation program to which actually it moved on later on uh, when we hired developmental biologists. Um, so Sarah was one of the first hires um, together with, uh, I think it was uh, Björn Wenström, Erwin Wagner, Rolf Müller, um, one more, I forgot. Um, and and we, they formed, uh, I think, a very nice group of people that interacted a lot, uh, all interested in, in, in growth control. And this is where Sarah made her uh, major contributions. But before I uh, talk about it, let me briefly mention that the move for me from the German Cancer Center, which at that time, I must say, was sort of a, a German old-fashioned type of research institutes with isolated floors, isolated groups, and when I came here, it was like breathing fresh air. Everybody was talking to everybody. And there was no hierarchy. You know, Leonard Philipson went through the corridors, and I saw him talking to the gardener, to the, to the cleaning lady, or to the gardener, or, or to a group leader. It didn't matter. He, he was, there was no barriers. And, and this, of course, transpired to the rest of the institute. And, and so that was great. And then there were other things like, you know, unbureaucratic administration, uh, good food in the canteen, um, lots of fun, fun things to do, volleyball games. And, you know, I really, really uh, blossomed here. And I must say, uh, I, I keep my years here at Emble very much uh, as a special place. And I think it, it, it remained this way. And I think when Sarah then joined in 1985. Um, I think she, she also, I think from what she told me, she, she also really enjoyed this time, time here. Um, 
So Sarah, uh, just to very briefly mention your many achievements of which some of uh, the important ones you have made while you were here. Just before coming uh, from Mill Hill, you had shown that the polyoma middle T antigen, which was a major uh, viral specific oncogene, was actually uh, working in, in, in close collaboration with the so-called cellular SARC gene. Now the SARC gene was the first cell-derived oncogene that was discovered by Michael Bishop, where she had done her postdoc, and for which Michael Bishop she had a Nobel Prize later. And, and she continued to work on, on SARC and other tyrosine kinases, because that's what SARC encodes for her whole career. And she had the vision at that time that this is not only interesting for basic research, but also uh, had translational applications. And I must say, I, I never saw that at that time. But uh, she actually, I think she, she recognized it very early. And, and so she stayed here for almost 10 years, nine years, I think. And then uh, it happens that she also got a call, in this case from Yossi Schlesinger, who uh, had founded a company together with Axel Ulrich in the United States called uh, Schlesinger Ulrich Sujen, um, and asked her to become the scientific director of this uh, pioneering uh, company. At that time, there were not so many uh, startup companies in the field. And she then became the vice director of research. And in her five years there, the company developed a compound that is now uh, in the hands of Pfizer, uh, who had swallowed Pharmacia, who had swallowed Sujin, you know, the typical small company swallowed up by the bigger ones. So with this patent, and I, I, I almost fell off my chair, uh, Pfizer makes more than $1 billion uh, as a drug that cures uh, certain gastrointestinal tumors and kidney tumors. So you can see that if you are lucky and you hit on the, on the right thing, you can become very rich too. <laughs> anyway, so Sarah, um, Sarah's contributions uh, were, as I mentioned, uh, numerous. Uh, I just very briefly want to point out, she found that it's, it's not uh, just a single, uh, well, that it is an important part of the signal transduction pathway which is initiated by the binding of ligands to growth factor receptors like the PDGF receptor and the macrophage colony stimulating receptor. Uh, that it is part of a family of other tyrosine kinases in, uh, that participate in, 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 in signal transduction, that it is regulated by yet another tyrosine kinase, which is inhibitory. Um, and um, last not least, uh, I wanted to mention um, that, yeah, very important that the signal transduction pathway that was triggered by the ligand binding and SARC participation ended up in the activation of yet another oncogenous transcription factor, MYC. And that this was essential and key to explain the activity of these uh, oncogene-like uh, transcription factors in inducing cell proliferation. So that, I think that was a very, very key base, uh, finding of, of major importance. So, during her time then, as I just said, Sarah was extremely productive um, and she was always very focused on her work. I remember sometimes coming in very late to check my chicken cell cultures, sneaked into the lab, and where was there in the neighboring lab, Sarah, bending over her, her endless uh, gel electrophoresis gels, uh, pipetting them or looking at the results. And I think she probably barely noticed me. Um, so then, of course, Sarah, uh, after being very successful, she was promoted in 1991 as the first senior scientist at EMBL. So that was a uh, female senior scientist. It was, by that time, unheard of because you know, all research laboratories were um, dominated by, by males, also at EMBL. Um, and with her 
secure position, she could have, of course, continued at EMBL if she hadn't gotten the call from, from Sujin. But it was actually very uh, brave of her because uh, at the time, um, the, the mixing of basic research and, 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 and business corporate was not well seen. In fact, uh, Leonard Philipson himself said, you know, get patents, that's fine, but no exclusive licenses, make them broadly available. He was completely against these close links to companies. And I remember at the, when the at ZMBH in Heidelberg was founded uh, at the, initi at the uh, uh, initiation cer ceremony, students came in with posters protesting against the connection between ZMBH and uh, I think it was BISF who had uh, given five million euros to, to found this new, new research place. These were the times uh, 30 years ago, uh, how much has changed the world now. Um, so then let me just say that when Sarah uh, returned to academia in, in the year 2000, she had several important uh, leading positions and in institutes in, in Michigan and Oregon. And she continued to work on the functions of SARC and identified several important targets, uh, mostly in, uh, located to the protosomes or invadopodia, which are critical structures for metastasis. And uh, from what I've read, uh, she has already done the compound screens and found several compounds that inhibit this function of, of SARC. And, and one of them seemed to be very promising to, as a potential cure for, for metastasis. So Sarah has received many awards and honors. I just want to read a few of them. The Harden Medal and Lecture of the British Biochemical Society, the Feodor Lunen Medal and Lecture, an honorary doctorate of the University of Leeds in 2016, I believe. Um, then she got uh, a very prestigious Charlotte Friend Memorial Lectureship and in the last year, she got two top uh, recognitions. One is the prestigious Rosalind Franklin Award that had previously been given to the likes of John Stites, John Brugge, Maxine Singer, Singer Janet Rowley, and Tizia De Lange. These are all giants in the field. And last year, she was uh, elected as a fellow of the American Association of Cancer research, which was sort of almost an induction of the Hall of Fame of cancer researchers. So in addition to these uh, honors, Sarah is a member of, a, of the SAP of several companies and research institutes, editorial board of uh, several high-ranking journals, has been an organizer of uh, and program chair of uh, the annual uh, AACR, uh, American Academy of Cancer Research Society, and so the list goes on. Let me just finish by saying and pointing out that Sarah, as a female researcher, and, and I was very well aware of that, she felt very often the thin air at the top echelons of academic and corporate research. And so she had become actually a, a very early and outspoken advocate for gender equality in science. So with this, Sarah, I would like to congratulate you for your Great work, and I would like to hand you over the medal together with Erin. Uh, uh, Please join us. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was, that was lovely, uh, and a brief trip through my long career. Um, I am so honored to be here. I'm thrilled to be here and to be back here after very many years, and of course, very honored uh, to receive this award, and I'd like to thank the Alumni Association for that. Um, it is particularly meaningful for me that it is named after Leonard Philipson, who was the Director General for most of my years here, who was a wonderful man kind and supportive and generous, and really enabled all of us, I think, 
to do what we, what we did. He encouraged us, but didn't put any barriers in our way. And just it was a fantastic experience. But I will also say that I'm grateful to Fotis Kafatos, who was the DG for my last couple of years here, because if he had not had the vision, I think, to create what I think was also the first visiting senior scientist position that enabled me to go to SUGEM whilst also retaining my lab here for a year and commuting, yes, from San Francisco to Heidelberg every three weeks, uh, so that my, my people could finish off their, their great science and get papers and get new positions. Without that, I would not have made that career transition. So that was also very important in, in my career. So I'm gonna try and just uh, tell you briefly um, just how I got to the, the stage that I'm at now. You've heard some of it from Thomas. Um, and then I want to just to tell you about some of the science that we've been doing in recent years. And I hope that is going to show you that we've continued to try to span basic and translational research in what we've been doing since I, since I left the company. So I think we all have to have our pictures and so I did manage to find this one. I was a little shocked to discover I had the same hairstyle, but that is indeed, indeed me. And that, that was its natural color. I guess this is its natural color as well. Um, this is uh, my lab, and it was on the sixth floor, one of the last iterations of the lab, a happy bunch of people. Um, we had no air conditioning at that point. My lab on the sixth floor funneled all the hot air to do our 30 degree kinase assays in the summer, we used to move our water bath into the cold room. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what it was like. And I visited there this morning, I had to see if I could still find my way there, and I could. And it was lovely and cool. Uh, and then this is actually one of the senior scientist meetings, Thomas, um, right here, uh, along with fellow senior scientists when I, when I joined that illustrious group and we were clearly engaged in discussing something or other. I'm not quite sure what. Okay. So as you heard from Thomas, um, what we did while we were here was some fundamental research on the structure, regulation, and function of Sark family kinases. And I'm not going to say um, too much more about that. You heard about you know, oncogenesis from DNA tumor viruses, a role in the transition from quiescent cells into the G1 phase of the cell cycle, as well as a role in mitosis. What I wanted to emphasize by talking about those was the phenomenal collaborations that I had with people at EMBL that allowed all of this to happen. I think many of us realize as we move around different institutions that so much about setting up a collaboration is often that you're nearby, that you're chatting, maybe you're having a coffee, maybe you're having a beer uh, in the bar later, and ideas come to you, or you go to seminars and you hear them. It's not so easy to set up collaborations at a distance. You, know, you do those for the necessary ones. But some of these things would never have happened otherwise. And so those include collaborations with Giulio Draetta and Giulio Superti Fogo when they were here, using Schizosaccharomyces pombi as a vehicle to study the regulation of Sark tyrus in kinase. Who'd have thought? Um, we collaborated with Rainer Peppercock and Wilhelm Ansorger and used the microinjection system to identify how SART kinases were controlling cell cycle. With Matti Saraste and Rick Warenga on structural analysis initially of SH3 domains, and they uh, uh, solved the first structure of an SH3 domain. We then did that for a SART family kinase. And then um, Rick uh, eventually uh, solved the whole SART structure. Uh, and with Irvin Wagner on some mouse modeling of the role of uh, polyomavirus middle T in tumorigenesis, as well as a study that I'll mention a little bit more, but with Toby Gibson, uh, who did some of the bioinformatics analysis for us on a SARC substrate that turned out to be very important in the last 20 years or so of our research. So I think these are really important things. But as Thomas said, I just will briefly, I'm not going to give you a company talk by any means. Uh, I was asked to go and join Sujen, and that was intriguing me because, uh, as Thomas said, I was starting to realize that there were opportunities beyond using very fundamental model systems uh, that perhaps could be used to change human treatment of human disease. 
And so when I was offered the opportunity to build a research department at Sugen that already had a drug screening section going, I realized that I would learn a lot of things here, um, including I would have an opportunity to, to be there and learn about what it takes to make drugs, what it takes to then get them into the clinic, all of those different aspects. And so I'm very proud of my colleagues at Sujen who developed the drug Sunitinib, which now Pfizer gains from them to the tune of a billion dollars a year for sure, but then people gain from it too. So when I went, uh, kinases were known to be amongst the most common cancer genes even at that time. And clearly it's an enzyme and you think you can, you can affect enzymes with small molecules. But there was a, a lot of, uh, of skepticism about whether you could ever get something that was selective enough. In, you know, we now know that um, kinase inhibitors, there are many of them in the clinic. I'm sorry, I'm missing all these things. Many on the market, I won't, I won't go through that. Many more in development. This clearly turned out to be a strategy that did work. But in fact, most of the kinome remains unexplored. And let me just point out what I mean by the kinome. This was actually work done, the bioinformatics analysis, a, a degenerate PCR um, followed by a, a sequencing analysis of all the products that led the Sugen bioinformaticists to do this and this, make this unrooted dendrogram comparing the kinase domains of all known mammalian kinases. This is human. Uh, Tony Hunter, who was on our SAB, uh, also assisted us with the analysis. But this analysis told us about 518 uh, kinases in the human genome. There are actually, to this date, it's only been increased by three. There are 521, so it was a pretty good analysis. Um, and what's interesting is if you look in the literature, this was in the year 2000 that we published this. If you look in the literature about how many kinases are studied, this is probably a little out of date, but the, it makes the point. Uh, here's a, a particular kinase identified, and then here's the number of publications. And what you see is that there's still, most of people are looking under the light here, right? You know, looking for your lost keys, go under, the, look under the lampshade. Would, most people are looking at this, and there are many, many kinases that have very few publications and we know very little about. And that always has stuck with, has stuck with me, and you'll see when I come to the end that I'm just going to talk about how we've uh, used that or thought about that to try and uh, de-orphanize a lot of these kinases to see if any of them could be valuable for the treatment of human disease as well. But I'll, I'll come to that later. So I was at the company for, for six years, um, and as Thomas said, and as that saying goes, the little fish is eaten by the larger and larger one until the shark comes along. Uh, I actually left before the shark, but after a big fish. And the reason that I did that is that I'm a complete science nerd. Um, I worked at the bench myself here at EMBL, as Thomas was saying, for most of my years here. And even when I stopped, I gave up doing the experiments myself, my competence was lacking in modern techniques, I guess, but I still was, would, would hang out in the lab. And so the opportunity to become a pharmaceutical company executive was not very appealing to me and to be a little bit more divorced from the science because I still maintained a real interest in the basic science as well as in translational aspects. And so at, at the time after Sujan had been bought for a year, uh, I decided that I would leave and I came back to the light side, as some would call it, and uh, as opposed to the dark side that I was working at, uh, and decided to, uh, to get going again on fundamental research. And the question was what to work on. Because I came on my own, uh, I, d I left my lab behind, they all had pharma positions and so they didn't want to and nor, nor you know, should I have disrupted what they were doing. And so I, ca I came on my own to an institute uh, in Michigan uh, and was faced with starting anew. And I also didn't want to do the same things that I'd been doing before and where cancer uh, drugs were all being focused on at the time. I should say this is the 2000 hallmarks of cancer by uh, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, pointing out the different things that cancer cells have to be able to do to become a cancer. And most of the effort at that time was on the proliferative signaling, angiogenesis, uh, resisting cell death. Now this hallmarks has been updated recently to include a lot about the immune system and the like. But there's a lot of people working on that system. But what intrigued me at the time was that there's one aspect of the cancer phenotype activating invasion and metastasis, which is the thing that kills over 95% of all cancer patients, but we knew the least about. 
We had an awful lot of information courtesy of work on oncogenes, et cetera, uh, on all of these other pathways. But really, we had very little understanding of how invasion and metastasis is controlled. And to some extent, that's actually still true. And yet, if this is the aspect of cancer that we want to target or combine with other drugs, we really are going to have to know the basic science. And so that's when um, I decided that this is what we were going to work on. How do you get into a field like that? Well, it so happened, I mentioned Toby Gibson already. Let me mention Peter Locke right here, who was a postdoc in my lab at EMBL. There he is uh, in the lab. And he had set about to clone novel SARC substrates. He decided we didn't have enough, we didn't know enough about the things that SARC phosphorylates. And so he set up a, uh, an unbiased screening strategy to clone novel SARC substrates. And he cloned a number of, he cloned known substrates and a number of new genes. Uh, only one of which really have we ever worked on because it has consumed our last uh, couple of decades. Uh, and that um, was a protein that when we were here, when we first published it, we called it FISH for five SH3 domains. So it is a big adapter molecule um, that likes to bind other proteins via proline-rich sequences. It is a SARC substrate. And what it also had that was new at the time, and Toby identified by, by looking at it in, in databases, was a novel domain of about 130 amino acids. Now, he coined a term for it. We wrote the paper with our term. And Chris Ponting in Oxford published a paper right at that time saying, I've discovered this new domain called the PX domain for Fox homology domain. It was the same domain. We gave it a different name, so we'll call it the PX domain. We now know this is a lipid binding module, a phosphatidyl inositol lipid binding module, um, which helps to link proteins like this to membranes. Uh, and TIX5 and its relatives has a very unusual uh, specificity that takes it, uh, for example, to the invader podia that I will only briefly mention. So, I decided, so this, I should say that I had a one hobby project. It's, I had a lab at Sujen that worked on mainstream things for the company, but I have one hobby project courtesy of Claire Abram, who was funded by a Human Frontiers grant that, that I got whilst I was at EMBL, I got with um, Tony Pawson. Uh, and so she worked on, on TIX5 uh, while, while we were at Sujen and did some analysis about where it was in cells and how it was regulated by this lipid binding, et cetera. Uh, and then more later at, uh, San, in San Diego, and this is my lab there, uh, Matt Bushman cloned a, a homolog, TIX4. So we've spent most of the last years working on these adapter proteins, and I have absolutely no time to go into any of the details, but I will just tell you um, that it is found in these structures called podosomes or invader podia, which are plasma membrane protrusions uh, and they act, we now know, to cluster and coordinate pericellular proteolysis. So the proteolysis of the extracellular matrix, as well as, we think, the uh, clipping and activation of growth factors and the like. And we showed from a number of studies that these adapters play a vital role in development as well as in cancer formation, uh, in, in both in the initial tumor growth, somewhat surprisingly, as well as in metastasis. Now, Shinji Izuka, who was uh, a postdoc with me at the Burnham and when we moved to Oregon Health and Science University uh, some years ago, uh, has been involved in both of the studies that I'm going to tell you very briefly about. Um, but I, I will summarize what, what we knew when Shinji joined the lab, which is some of the sort of biochemistry, if you will, of the interactions that these adapters make with the extracellular matrix, with the actin cytoskeleton to affect some of these, uh, some of these um, properties. So, sorry, let me just go back for a second. I'm missing this one. So, we had shown using um, model systems of injecting human tumor cells into animals that there was a role um, for TIX5 in, in cancer cell development. Uh, and we'd also um, set up a screen when I was at the Burnham, a high content imaging screen, uh, microscopy screen, to look for targets of invader podia to understand how they're regulated. And we originally used that screen. Um, using small molecules as a proof of principle for the fact that you could target invader podia with small molecules. So once I moved to OHSU and Shinji came with me, we wanted to do two things, and I'm going to very briefly mention those. 
Um, in the first, we wanted to get to a mouse model of cancer rather than relying upon animals without an immune system um, to, to study uh, tumor growth and to get to a model where we could look at natural metastasis as well. Uh, but then we also, as I alluded to, I've always tried to keep my lab balanced between the basic research and the translational research. So we also wanted to capitalize on the fact that we'd developed a screening assay and we wanted to screen for new therapeutic targets. And so these are the two vignettes that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, one of them is as yet unpublished, um, the first one, and the Invaderpodia screen was just very recently published, so newish data. So first a conditional um, deletion. So this turned out to be quite complicated to get it. It is a, a pretty complicated uh, genome structure. Uh, over 250 megabases, but fortunately for us, the PX domain, which is the critical functioning domain in tumorigenesis for TIX5, is encoded in these first five exons, and so um, we had LOCKS P sites inserted either side of, this, of, these tic, of these PX domain exons so that we would mediate a frame shift uh, and we would not be able to make this longest form of the gene. I should just say there is a shorter form that lacks this anyway when we leave that intact. And then the question was, what model system were we going to use? Because we know that this protein is needed in development, and so we couldn't do, use a, a cancer system where we knocked our gene out from the very beginning because we wouldn't have mice to do the experiment with. So we needed an inducible system. Uh, and Bill Muller and Louis Chodos had just developed this conditional uh, transformation system using the polyomavirus middle T antigen, so coming back to a place I started, whereby you can insert these um, these transgenes into the mice, cross it into your uh, floxed allele mice, but you don't elicit tumorigenesis until you add doxycycline to the drinking water for the mice. Uh, and in this system, the doxycycline is also controlling the Cree recombinase, and so in the same cells that you induce the oncogene, you will loop out the exon 3 and delete TIX5 from those very cells. So we could wait for mouse development to happen, wait for mammary gland, this is a breast cancer model, wait for mammary gland development to happen, and then we could induce the oncogene, much more like what would happen in human cancer, where you would not have the cancer from an embryo, uh, and then at the same time we can knock out TIX5 with the appropriate crosses and ask what we see. So here's what we see. So first of all, this is just looking at mammary glands uh, and uh, the liver uh, of these different mice. So this, this is um, wild-type mammary glands uh, shown here, just a uh, whole mount. Here's tumors, a uh, heavily, heavily burden of tumors if you still have TIX5. And if you've removed TIX5, you have a really hard time. You have very, very small tumors. Uh, when we looked at, and I'll show you some more data here, when we looked at the lungs of these animals, because this is a highly metastatic cancer model, the lungs of the, and this is only three weeks of, do, of dox induction, uh, the lungs of the wild-type mice, wild type, expressing middle T with wild-type TIX5, are completely uh, inundated with metastases, whereas only a few metastases are seen here. So if we um, do palpation experiments to look and see what have we changed here, uh, we actually do not change the initiation, so we can find very small initiating tumors in both with or without TIX5. But somewhat surprisingly, we, we affected not just the metastasis that you can see here, but also the progression of these tumors uh, into uh, overt cancers. And so we were not expecting to see such a change in, in the size there. And that turned out to be because, in fact, what we have developed here is a model of ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, so this is a stage, of course, at which very many women are diagnosed with a pre-invasive breast cancer. In mouse, it's called mammary intra-epithelial intra -epithelial neoplasia. And this is exactly what happens without TIX5. And it's easier seen here in the wild type or the TIX5 knockout, just the laminin staining for the basement membrane surrounding the mammary glands here. You can see it's intact in the case of Having, we're not having TIX5, but the invasive phenotype that you would expect to see is full, fully on when you have TIX5. So 
this is a model system that hasn't been one, so that's actually going to prove very useful, but it also gives you ideas about what might happen if you can stop invader podia formation. You could stop tumors in a pre-invasive stage. Surprisingly, and this is really preliminary, and who knows whether this will ever see the light of day until we give the model to somebody else, we also looked at the immune components of these tissues, and we found a profound difference in the immune composition of these tumors, whether they had TIX5 or not. So that suggests a model system that we're working on now, which is that if you have, in, we're gonna use TIX5 as the surrogate for invader podia formation, that if you have invader podia, we, I've already told you it activates the proteases and that allows extracellular matrix degradation and therefore invasion and metastasis. But our model is that you also will change the regulation of cytokines and chemokines, which are all made in a pro form that has to be activated by proteolysis. And in doing that, you're affecting the stromal microenvironment of the tumor. And those two things together affect both cancer growth and metastasis. Okay, so very briefly then, uh, that's one vignette. Here comes an even shorter vignette. How are we going to change this? TIX5 is an adapter protein. It has no catalytic activity whatsoever. So we're not gonna try and change that for the clinic. And so I was at a kinase company, Sujen did the kinome, and so the obvious thing for us was to screen the kinome individually, every single kinase, for those that affect invader podio function. And we did that, we found several. Again, we've only worked on one, and it is a serine kinase called Tau3 won't go into why it's called Tau3. We collaborated, my collaborators at OHSU, to show that it's overexpressed in many cancers, and this is, happens to just be an expression in melanoma, for example, metastatic melanoma, to show how, uh, how highly um, expressed it is. We did all the standard experiments of invader podia formation, growth in 3D, which is affected um, by the loss of TIX5, uh, as well as tumor analysis, first with a knockout of TIX5, of uh, tau 3, but then next with a small molecule inhibitor that my colleagues from the Burnham Institute developed with us. They put a screen through a small molecule kinase inhibitor to show that indeed biochemical inhibition of, uh, of tau 3 kinase affects all of these functions, including tumor growth and, extra, and extravasation. So here's tumor growth, for example, where we start to treat after we have the tumors at a certain size. Here's the vehicle control, and here's treating with the tau 3 inhibitor. So we think this is a very promising start. This may not be the kinase where the inhibitor gets developed, but as I said, we developed a number of them um, that I think uh, can be taken forward, and I know some companies are interested in that. Just uh, in my, in my uh, last data slide, um, to bring this back to basic science, we of course wanted to, do, to identify mechanism. So we did a screen for substrates of tau-3 because it's a kinase that there were no, almost no papers on, fit my criteria earlier. And we found a protein called LIC2. So LIC2, I'll show you in a moment what it is, an adapter protein. Um, but first of all, let me, we, and we'd also shown that tau-3 uh, is on recycling endosomes. So this brought me back to my days of cell biology here as well. And we could show that this small molecule inhibitor that we developed inhibits the trafficking of RAB11 positive recycling endosomes, not all endosomes. Uh, and this is not a general feature of a SARC inhibitor in this case. It is specific to the inhibition of tau-3. So that was kind of intriguing. Let me just finish up by telling you uh, what LIC2 is. So LIC2 is a member of this group here uh, of um, associated proteins uh, to, the, to the dynings. So we have vesicle movement in positive and negative directions controlled by, by kinesins in one case and dynings in the other. And what we've worked out with this is that tau-3 is actually a negative regulator uh, of trafficking to the membrane, but if we inhibit it, then we shut off this, sorry, the other way around. If we inhibit it, then we allow the, the um, the movement, the kinesin-based movement, to go to invader podia, and that allows the trafficking of TIX5 into invader podia and allows the formation um, of invader podia and therefore a metastasis. So that gives us a lot of other potential targets, actually, that could be hit within this pathway as well. So that was my life up until December 31st, 2021. So a number of you know that I retired on that date, and so what's next? What now? So partly I just, uh, I want to hope that as well as leaving the body of published work um, that we have, and the fantastic people I've had in my lab, 
um, that we've left to talk it for others to continue these studies. I, as I said, I am very grateful to all my tra trainees and to my collaborators. And I have very fond memories of each of the places I've worked, but particularly fond memories of, of EMBL. But it does leave me more time for hobbies. So this is one of mine, actually two of mine. Um, I've taken up bird watching in the last years, and now I also am into photography. And I think I will never better this photo of this bird, which is quite a rare bird for, for where I live. It's a blue grosbeak, if anybody cares. Um, but I will aspire to be at least that good in future uh, photographic efforts. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I last came here in 2010. That was way too long ago. And so I've made myself a promise to not make it so long if you'll have me in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was absolutely fantastic. What a great body of work. And that was a beautiful picture of a bird. It's hard to go on away from this slide. It's fantastic. So we really have been lucky here today because we've had the pleasure of having Maria and Sarah in person to hear these fantastic talks. But we'd really like to draw attention to the fact that over the last two years, we haven't been able to do this in person. We've had the last two ceremonies online. Um, the last two winners of the Leonard Philip Philipson Award were uh, in 2020. I have to think of the years. So we're 2022. So two years ago, it was John. And last year, it was Ken. Unfortunately, we lost Ken. He um, passed away recently, and John couldn't be here to celebrate with us, but we'd like to again give them a, an applause in person to celebrate their award along with that of Sarah's. So, congratulations to the last three years.